Welcome to another edition of InfoWars Nightly News. This evening's date, Monday, March 26, 2012. Here is a rundown of what's coming up. Tonight on the InfoWars Nightly News. First, the prostitute media runs to the defense of globalist kingpin John Corzine, even after he's been caught repeatedly perjuring himself and stealing more than $200 million of people's private funds. Next, we expose the secret behind the biggest blockbuster sci-fi film ever, The Hunger Games. Next up, Harvard scientists reverse the aging process in mice. Next, they say it's humans. And finally, Syrian girl joins us from an undisclosed location to break down the role of the U.S. and Israel in provoking unrest in Syria and staging terror attacks in the nation with Al-Qaeda. All that and a lot more tonight. It's InfoWars Nightly News. Strap yourselves in. Let's look first at Don John Corzine. The media is running to his defense saying, oh, he didn't mean to perjure himself to Congress. He didn't know that billions of dollars had been sent overseas. He didn't know that hundreds of millions of it was taken out of people's private accounts. Well, now it's coming out that they have the memos, they have the documents, Bloomberg, AP, Reuters, they're all reporting. They know that Mr. Corzine ordered as CEO of MF Global that those funds be transferred. And I want to go ahead and go to a couple clips that we've pulled out of the archives. The first video is of Terrence Duffy in Congress a few months ago saying that, yes, the CEO of MF Global did know about the transfers, something that Corzine had just denied the day before. Here's that clip. After receiving this information, CME remained at MF Global while MF Global atten attempted to identify funds that could be transferred into segregation to reduce or eliminate the discrepancy. A CME auditor also participated in a phone call with senior MF Global employees, wherein one employee indicated that Mr. Corzine knew about the loans that had made for the customer segregated from the customer segregated accounts. CME Group has provided this information of these individuals to the Department of Justice and the CFTC who are investigating these matters. So the system is covering up for somebody that took farmers and ranchers and little old ladies money that was in their own private accounts that they used to then invest in the futures trading system controlled by the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. This is even starting to blow me away, despite the fact that I know how corrupt these folks are. Of course, he's the former head of Goldman Sachs, the major kingpin criminal group. Shifting gears now uh, to the criminal justice department who refuses to go after uh, John Corzine. Fast and furious probe, chief suspect released more than once. Well, that's because it isn't a suspect. It's someone they were using as a conduit on record in federal court documents to ship the guns into Mexico. Manuel Celius Acosta, the chief suspect in the ATF's Fast and Furious investigation, who was caught but released at the U.S.-Mexico border in May of 2010, was also stopped and released two months earlier while in possession of a Colt 38 caliber pistol purchased illegally under the gun tracking operation. So you've got the police state that's set up to harass citizens catching him over and over again, but it's a catch and release type situation. And one of the memos that came out last year's show, as if we needed the memos to know this, it was all part of a plan to blame the Second Amendment and call for the ban of all semi-automatic rifles and handguns. That's about 72% of all guns out there in the name of stopping violence in Mexico. It was about blaming America and the Second Amendment for what these terrorists did. That's a false flag terror attack against our country if I've ever seen one. Now, here's an amazing story. You know, people want to talk about uh, things that are in movies like Blade Runner as being science fiction, as being unbelievable, uh, as being something that's crazy and can never actually happen. You know, in that movie, they have designer fish, designer lizards, designer birds. 
designer humans. For decades, they've had cloned humans. They just kill them at the embryonic level before they're born. That's been on record in the scientific publications, but not on the news. And for more than 15 years, I've seen major peer-reviewed published reports of rodents, other mammals, insects, uh, uh, worms, being able to live five, six, seven, eight times their normal lifespan when they genetically manipulate and put these mice and rats on different diets. Well, finally, it's starting to get attention. Here's a report. Harvard scientist reversed the aging process in mice, now for humans. Harvard scientists were surprised that they saw a dramatic reversal, not just a slowing down, reversal of the aging in mice. Now they believe they might be able to regenerate human organs. Folks, you're being told about stuff that's decades old. The elite, Ray Kurzweil and others say, that's why they want global government. That's why they want to reduce the rest of us because they're not going to let us have access to all these technologies. They're literally becoming gods, they believe. They are being given the fire of the gods from Prometheus. But of course, Prometheus and the Prometheus myth actually tried to empower all of humanity and was punished by the gods. So you guys are trying to behave more like the jealous uh, gods of antiquity. You're not gods, you're humans, and you're going to destroy our planet in the process if you're not stopped. Uh, so there is that report. We'll be giving you more reports on that throughout the week. In fact, Thursday, We've got a big special report on this tying it in to the Illuminati, Secret Society, Babylon, Mystery Religion Schools, and the new film coming out, Prometheus, put out by Ridley Scott. So that's coming up Thursday. By the way, coming up later tonight, we're going to air the Billy Corgan interview that we did a week and a half ago sitting at this table. And so that's coming up after the nightly news this evening. I should uh, remind viewers out there of that. We're so blessed to even be here and be able to cover this information with you. All right, shifting gears into the latest media uh, distraction and diversion. Trayvon Martin, I think that Zimmerman was wrong to follow him down the street, but the photos we're seeing of Trayvon when he's 12, well, he's 17 now, you know, 6'3", uh, Mr. Zimmerman reportedly 5'2". Uh, and there are witnesses in the police reports that say that Trayvon was on him, basically physically beating him. And now it's coming out that he was trying to take the gun from Mr. Zimmerman. Uh, so nobody is right in this situation. It's a tragedy, but undoubtedly, this is being used to push division in this country by the elite. They want us fighting with each other. Uh, Mike Adams of Natural News has done a great report on this. Let's talk about real threats. A hundred Trayvons a day, why the real murder of blacks is carried out by pharmaceutical companies, vaccines, and cancer clinics. And it goes over the fact that you've got a much better chance, whether you be Hispanic, black, white, it doesn't matter, of being killed by the medical establishment than being shot and killed in a crime or anything else. And I saw some comments when we posted this article this morning saying, you know what, Alex? We're tired of you pandering uh, to black people all day. You know, this is a big spectacle. It's all anti-white. You know, we're sick of you, you know, writing an article about how big pharma is only killing blacks and not other people. Listen, get this straight. We've got a major issue going on with the elite trying to cause a race war in this country, which they're going to use to take all of our liberties, namely our Second Amendment. And... By reaching out to black people and pointing out how 52% of them are being aborted, uh, how they're having things tested on them like everybody else, we can get folks to stop fighting with each other. And quite frankly, from historical research, black people in this country were the first group to be beta tested on in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s with syphilis, radiation, foster kids uh, are being taken and having things tested on them, most of them are black. So the fact is, I think Mike Adams is dead on about this. And for all these white people that I know who aren't really racist, but are sick of everybody telling them they're racist all day, so they've just gotten tired of it all and kind of run over to the other side of saying, okay, if I'm racist, if you say I'm racist, I'll go ahead and you know go along with that. Everybody is in the same boat together, okay? And... The globalists want to manipulate us against each other. 
And so we've got to stop it. Does that mean go along with the political correctness and hate yourself because you're white? No. But we've got to recognize that political correctness and multiculturalism is designed to destroy all of our cultures. And we've got to ask ourselves, why is that? So the system can replace our cultures with this plastic corporate death. But if we won't just have a ceasefire and look at the facts and be honest, we can't expect to ever defeat the New World Order. And then after the New World Order is defeated, if the black supremacists and the white supremacists want to kill each other, great, go ahead. Just right now, I want to defend the sovereignty of this country, the Second Amendment, private property rights, the family, and I want to stop the killing of children across the board. And a lot of you racists that say, like Khalid Muhammad would say, kill all the white babies. You know, I dare black folks to actually go out and kill white babies. They're innocent, just like black babies are innocent. And, and I tell all of you out there that say, hey, let's kill all the Arabs, let's carpet bomb them, let's nuke them, let's glass parking lot them. Can you actually do what Sergeant Bales did and actually go blow toddlers' heads off? No, you can't. So don't sit there and talk about how great genocide is when you couldn't do it yourself. We're giving up our humanity here with all this racist garbage. And I understand the system uses it to beat people down and, and to divide us. I get that the anti-racism is what's actually pushing most of the race stuff. I get that. I'm just saying we've got to be sophisticated enough to understand what's happening here. You know, when people called me racist for saying, hey, wait, Obama's using this Trayvon Martin thing as a political diversion, saying he looks like his son and all this, it's disgusting. I got attacked for that. But did I get mad because some black folks didn't understand what I was saying? No. I simply continued to explain the facts to them, and now most of those people have, have apologized to me. It, it, look, reality is sophisticated. It's complex. If you want something simple, go to the mainstream news and get somebody reading off a teleprompter to you. That's what's gotten us into this situation. And by the way, the truth's starting to come out. Turns out Mr. Zimmerman's got a bunch of black friends, including a local TV anchor guy who's come out and said he's friends with him and you know that he's got a lot of black friends and that he's really freaked out about what happened and he's not a racist. We've also got the former head of the NAACP uh, coming out and saying the epidemic is truly black on black crime. Bryant said the greatest danger to the lives of young black men are young black men, and that's absolutely true. You know, it's fun to get all tribal, all humans do it, and, and get all angry and say Whitey's out to get us, but at the final equation, what's destroyed the black community is now destroying all the other communities, and it's this government nanny state that makes you dependent. Prosperity makes monsters, adversity makes men. I'm reversing the quote by French philosopher Victor Hugo, but adversity makes men, prosperity makes monsters. That's what's happening here is this enslavement. Now, in other news at Infowars.com, Ron Paul suspects Supreme Court will rule monstrosity Obamacare constitutional would be a real tragedy if law is upheld. He told me two months before Obamacare passed Congress that it was going to pass. So he's got his ear to the ground. But I've seen all the big neocon publications getting everybody ready that, oh, the conservative members are probably going to vote for this. So get ready for their decision. They're getting everybody ready. Now, we all know the federal government making us buy insurance is not constitutional. It's slavery. But you've got to know it's not some liberal socialist communist movement. That's just the cover. The big banks that own the insurance companies want to make everybody buy insurance. Then it lets the government decide what care you get. So it's really a fascist model, even worse than socialism, if that's possible. And so, yes, I saw whole stacks of articles the last three days getting everybody ready for the Supreme Court to rule. You bet the government's going to make you buy things. Got to buy it from the company store. And government's taking over health care. So you're going to pay for all this, and then you're not going to be eligible for the medical care. So... It's like our own writer, Paul Watson, has been sick for over a month with a chest cold. He goes to the government doctor and they go, we're not giving you antibiotics, Jack. And he's like, well, let me go see a private practitioner. They're like, we decide if you can go see somebody. Only the elite can see that. Even if you have the money, sorry, here's a bag of aspirin. Get well or die. <laughs> uh, in fact, if you go to Infowars.com real quick, we have 
an incredible graphic up there that's a planned grandparenthood. The death panels, where you get bonus credit for going ahead and euthanizing grandpa and grandma. There it is. And this is actually what they're saying. They're saying in the bioethics journals, kill grandma, kill up to three-year-old children that are healthy. This is when you get in a socialized system with fascists on top of it. They get everybody fighting over resources. And Bill Gates says to teachers at a meeting a few years ago, kill grandma and get 10 jobs. And the teachers clapped, murder, kill them. Oh, look at grandpa. Oh, look, Junior's getting the money. Of course, he'll be killed later as well with his soft kill weapon. See, they got to get rid of health care because they're soft killing everybody with the cancer viruses because the government loves you so much. And a lot of members of the elite are going to be dying too. This is like just giving over to psychopathic systems. We're living in a science fiction movie, folks. We're living in a nightmare. Uh, let's shift gears now to the next article. DHS raids home to seize deadly Hair straighteners. I have this article right over here. It's at Infowars.com. But don't worry. The government's doing all this for our own safety. DHS raids home to seize deadly hair straighteners. That's even more ridiculous than when I've seen them raiding Amish with uh, milk or DHS involved going after lemonade stands. Federal agency founded to fight terrorism continues war on grooming appliances. Yes, Yes, it's uh, going on to keep us safe, but that's okay. Two weeks ago, the head of the CIA, General Petraeus, said, you know what? All of your new appliances, when you pay for them, have backdoor tech built in with data over power lines and wireless, your washing machine, your iPhone to track you. And Paul Watts has got an article out today, everything is spying on you. Forget 1984, the internet of things is the ubiquitous surveillance grid, and it's all there. The school's watching your kids over the, quote, free laptops you paid for with tax money. It's all there. It's all happening, and we've been proven right yet again. Now we will break down the secret of Hunger Games set more than 100 years in the future after America has been collapsed is an artificial system where the population has been turned into feudal slaves living at a subsistence level. It is the essence of Agenda 21. The suboid slaves are played off against each other in gladiatorial diversions. This is directly out of the globalist handbook. There you've got uh, Mr. Sutherland, uh, one of my favorite actors, on a jumbotron screen in a police state dystopic future at the Hall of Justice. Already at Walmart, Small America, and thousands of locations, giant jumbotrons are there with Big Sish, a uh, asexual creature, telling us that we all need to give our rights up because terrorists, Al-Qaeda namely, that they publicly fund to attack other nations, uh, is 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 hiding under every desk wanting to get us. Now, continuing here uh, with this film, now that I've had a chance uh, to uh, research it and go over it, this is really a piece of anti-establishment propaganda because you've got the 10 FEMA regions, the 10 governors, this plan globally to have 10 regions with 10 sub-regions per sector, across the world. This is really the UN model. And when you read the biological diversity assessments, they talk about bringing back gladiatorial games to teach people to fight with each other, not with the state, and having big centralized governments over the 10 global regions with 10 sub-regions per region. Uh, and you have a central government per 10 regions that plays the sub-10 regions off against each other via gladiatorial games. So the writer of this fiction book, uh, she's really got a deep understanding. And by the way, we're going to end up contacting her. We're trying now. But seeing the film, I can guarantee you that if she's not an InfoWars reader and Alex Jones listener, uh, that uh, she is a deep researcher into the New World Order and the system they want to set up because the 1996 UN Biological Diversity Assessment, I covered it in my 2002 film, Road to Tyranny, says they would have gladiatorial games, reintroduce human sacrifice, teach the people to fight with each other. Now, this film is basically from my notes, 
Robin Hood meets Romeo and Juliet meets 1984. And it is Agenda 21, where the central government over the subregions is artificially cutting off resources and executing, imprisoning and executing people who were caught killing a rabbit, killing a deer so they get food for their family. And the society has been artificially collapsed so that everybody is dependent on the central government that has the resources. Uh, you're not allowed to farm or ranch for your own good. This is what the New World Order is about. This is what Agenda 21, Behind the Green Mask, and the book that we sell at InfoWars.com uh, breaks down. This is what the corporatocracy is calling for. This is what Maurice Strong in 1992 and now this year is calling for a post-industrial world with these high-tech reservations that are government and corporations with the rest of us living in squalor outside of that, but unified by television broadcast of the giant gladiatorial games. Now, in part two and now part three coming out, the books, I haven't gotten to those yet, I'm um, talking to fans of it, though. I've got friends and family that are. It's more of a message of revolution against this. So Hollywood, in its desperate attempt to stay relevant, is more and more adopting the culture of resistance to these uh, eugenics, post-industrial, uh, deindustrialization cult, and people are really starting to wake up. So that is exciting. And we'll have some more reports uh, and reviews on The Hunger Games. Also saw a film on DVD that I think is pretty impressive called uh, In Time with Justin Timberlake, of all people, but it is a powerful message of the elite being able to live forever, but needing to reduce population to do it because you can't have too many people. That's also what this is all about. And we're also going to be reviewing here with a sneak peek months before it's out. Coming up this Thursday, Prometheus, the Ridley Scott film. So you want to stay with us on that. But you know, I wrote a lot of uh, notes here. I kept hearing about the Hunger Games, too busy to get focused on it. Now I've had a chance to see it. It's got Woody Harrelson in it as one of the trainers of the people that are involved, as one of the uh, winners of the Hunger Games, where you've got, again, children, the youth being sacrificed by the central government in a gladiatorial event. That's the tropism developed by every other authoritarian system in history, whether it was the Aztecs, the Babylonians, the Greeks had human sacrifice, the Romans, that's what the gladiatorial events were. Now, all of this human sacrifice in every single culture, ritualized warfare, because the elites are basically culling the population. This is an ancient truth, and that's why Hunger Games is so powerful. Any film that is extremely successful has a couple things behind it. A, the system pushes it. But more importantly, B, it has to trigger archetypal truths that we already know are there. And finally, it has to be presented in a powerful fashion. And so I'm not saying Hunger Games is even good in the final equation because the system has put it out to people. They believe the public so dumbed down, this will condition people to accept this future, which is what the UN and others are actually pushing. It's incredible. This is something they're actually pushing, a, real, uh, a, 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 a rewilding, going back to primitive times, gladiatorial events, human sacrifice. The UN actually calls for this, cutting off resources artificially to control populations because a true renaissance of clean energy, new systems, free energy systems threatens the monopoly. So the elite who are facing that are deciding to go into a new dark age where they have life extension and they have all these new systems, but, but that's blocked off from us. We're in a new dark age. They ascend to the next level with the Promethean fire. That is their plan. The question is, will you let them do that? You see, they know that you can never be given access to any of this or even know that it exists or you'll completely rebel and they'll lose their monopoly of power through the technological revolution because technology's a multifaceted sword with hundreds of edges. It's not just double-edged, good or evil. It has a fractal design of six dimensions of possibilities, and, and we make the future. That's why they want us walled off in this matrix-like system of American Idol and NFL totally feeling inadequate via the Madison Avenue brainwashing system with endless recruiting ads showing women rebelling against their boyfriend by shaving their heads and marrying the state and joining the Marine Corps. We're going to show that tomorrow night. I mean, sick stuff. So you can be injected with 
binary weapon systems and die young and be chewed up by DU. The system wants to destroy the family so we all marry the state and join the hive collective that uses us as uh, human resources. Another term hidden in plain view. So again, the system thinks they're throwing it in your face and you're weak and you'll just accept this as what's coming. I believe that when you see the facts, you will be enlightened and take action against the globalist. You're like, well, how do I bring them down? You don't bring them down by yourself. You resist, you rebel in small ways, and we kill them by a trillion cuts. The globalists are doing that to us incrementally. We resist them incrementally as well. Resistance is victory. Let me give you tonight's quote here uh, with this jumbo edition of InfoWars Nightly News. Okay, so tonight's quote is from Bob LaFavre, a uh, Alex Jones of decades ago who's now deceased. Government is a disease masquerading as its own cure, and he's the father of the Freedom School. Uh, he founded that, and we stand on people like Bob's shoulders. So we commend you, Bob, for all your work, and we say hi to you. Uh, they're watching from Valhalla. All right, we're going to go to break, and when we come back, we're going to talk to Syrian Girl, and then we're going to give you the big exclusive Smashing Pumpkins founder Billy Corrigan interview that is going to make Al Gore very, very angry. I, don't, I want to remind viewers this is teleprompter free real news. If you believe this is powerful information and you're watching this like millions of viewers out there uh, on YouTube and other video systems, if you want to support us and watch it when it first goes out every evening, and you want to see all my films and nine years of material and see video live of the daily radio show slash TV, become a prisonplanet.tv subscriber. It's only 15 cents a day. But you can do a 15-day free trial right now and test it out for free. And one membership is really six memberships. For every 15 cents a day membership, we allow six people to log in with the same username and passcode. Just be sure it's a username and passcode you only use on prisonplanet.tv. Don't, don't share it if it's on your bank account and stuff. But you create your own username and passcode, and you share it with up to five other people, and you can simultaneously be logged in. So that's six memberships for $5.95 a month or roughly 15 cents a day. And it is your support of the info war that has made all of this possible. We'll be right back with Syrian Girl. our biggest contest ever and we're looking for people who love freedom and who want to be all in in the resistance to tyrants so you say you want to fight the new world order why if you were on the radio if you were alex jones you'd really kick some globalist ass well here's your chance we're hiring not one but two new reporters whose reports are going to be on the radio, whose reports are going to be on the nightly news, who will even anchor the show. If you're ready, here's your chance to step into my shoes, and I hope you surpass what I've done. Two winners, $10,000 in prizes, and a shot to be a reporter inside the InfoWars.com command center. We're looking to hire one male reporter and one female reporter. And when you win, you win $5,000. Your video gets seen by hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people on YouTube. And you get put into the very front of the running to be hired as a reporter slash anchor right here in our operation. Do you have what it takes to be the next Info Warrior? The rules are posted below me here and at InfoWars.com. This is a big deal. You know, the globalists are expanding their global empire, but at the same time, the people are waking up all over the world. We've expanded our operations in the last year. We've added the nightly news five nights a week. We're making more special reports. We're reaching 15 million people every week. In a year, I want that to be 30 million. This is your chance to join the team. I want to see what you can do. But a big hint is this. Can your news piece make the news? Does it get people's attention? Does it educate people? Does it open minds? That's more important than being beautiful or speaking with perfect eloquence as an orator. 
All of that is important. But we're looking for people that have that magic spark, that fire of liberty in their heart, because I want you to join our team. I want to give you a launch pad so you can really take off and engage the globalist. And if this works, we'll have contests all the time and we'll continue to build this operation. I'm involved in a talent search looking for people who have the fires of liberty burning in their hearts and their minds. You've got until April 30th to complete your news report and then we'll announce the winners one week later. Are you gonna join the info war? Do you have what it takes? It's up to you. All serious entries will be posted on InfoWars.com. So everybody wins. You're getting the message of liberty out, and that's what really matters. But in the final equation, it's not about showing Alex Jones what you got. It's about showing the world and the globalist that no army can stop an idea whose time has come. Join me in the Info War. So you say you want to fight the info war. You say you want to go head up against the new world order. You can do a better job than Alex Jones. I know you can. And here's your chance to prove your mettle. We are back. Thank you for joining us. We've been uh, off for a pit stop, two-week hiatus. And coming up after uh, our next interview, to give us a perspective on the destabilization in the Middle East, we're going to premiere the hour-plus exclusive interview with the founder of the Smashing Pumpkins, Billy Corrigan, that we shot about a week and a half ago here at this table. So that's uh, coming up here in about 15 minutes or so, so please stay with us. First off, Syrian Girl has uh, been quite a sensation uh, on the internet. She's not like the people that have been caught working for the West who are from England and don't really live in Syria, who've been caught, uh, you know, Syrian Danny and others doing fake machine gun fire and claiming there's dead bodies all around them. No, uh, she doesn't even claim to be in Syria. She's in a undisclosed location, but of course, uh, her family is from Syria. In fact, uh, her family comes from the last ruling class uh, family there, so she doesn't even really like Assad. So I thought I would get her on uh, to talk about that and then look at Al-Qaeda on record being called freedom fighters and protesters blowing up military and police bases uh, a few weeks ago, and the protesters now for six months that have been shooting and killing people uh, that Anderson Cooper and others uh, are praising. So we're going to talk about that. Angelina Jolie, when she visited, uh, and more with Syrian Girl joining us from an undisclosed location. Syrian Girl, thank you for coming on with us. My pleasure. Let's get a little bit into yourself and, you know, as a Syrian, what your overall view, what your family's view is, if you can tell us on what's happening there, the different uh, forces that are involved. So when I was growing up, um, I was always given a very bad impression of the Syrian government, and I accepted this as the status quo, when obviously now that I'm older, I realize that's not true. But the reason for this is my family is actually from the previous bourgeois uh, ruling class and was deposed from power during the Baathist coup. My grandfather was in government and on, also on my mother's side, um, we had some land that was confiscated and whatnot, but um, that's okay, I guess. Um, basically, even in my own family, there's been some issues with the government where um, people have gone to prison and things like that. So I'm not pro-government. Um, I'm actually not pro very many governments in the entire world. I'm hard pressed to find one government that I find myself in agreement with. And I'm quite cynical in this view. I feel that um, 
you know, the state exists for the state alone. So I'm also suspicious of any new government that might ever arise. I, I just feel like um, whoever wins, the government always wins. So uh, I, I understand completely where um, people who have issues with the government are coming from. But on the, on the same hand, I also understand why there's a lot of support for the government. Education is free, healthcare is free in Syria. There's no um, foreign debt. Um, religions live amongst each other peacefully. So I, I see where both camps are coming from. On, but I have to, at this point in Syria, I'm, because you know Syria is not some island that is uh, separated from the rest of the world. Actually, Syria is very different to the, to the rest of the countries. We are surrounded by our, our enemies from every side of the border. So you can't just apply, you, you know, all, all other considerations that other countries might have, you know, revolutions and not consider where Syria is and who would benefit from it and who is causing it. And for Syria, you know, we need to have more security than other people. It's not like, we don't have a reason for it, or we have to invent a reason for it. We actually do have um, legitimate reasons to be suspicious. Um, so at this time, I just don't feel that, at, at any time, I don't feel that we should concern the world with our internal issues. You know, Syria's internal issues is that Syria. So it's an issue of national sovereignty, but look, we know that whether it's Uganda, or whether it's Libya, or whether it's Iraq, you can say these are bad leaders or good leaders. I mean, I mean, overall, obviously, I don't like big government authoritarian systems, so they're bad. But the West wants to come in and destabilize and wreck it, and then put Al Qaeda in charge. And so, when you've got those two choices there, it's obvious the West says they want to bring freedom to these places, but they don't uh, do that. Uh, and of course, you, you were on my show a month ago talking about it being Al Qaeda. That's in our news. It's being funded by the West. The same groups they used to topple Gaddafi now engaged in black genocide there. That's in the news, but a minor footnote. What about a few weeks ago, these giant blasts blowing up police headquarters, intelligence headquarters, and our media basically called it a protest. So, oh, the sweet little protesters are blowing up buildings. Uh, and this has been going on now for more than six months. I mean, it's it's just so ridiculous to watch Anderson Cooper uh, all breathless, hyperventilating uh, up there about how he wants to, and and and, and of course, you know, the, these fake reporters they've had that that have been caught lying. What do you think of that? I think it's been happening since the very beginning, but only now have they uh, has the media in the West. I mean, not all media, obviously, but. Uh, only now is is it really coming to light? You know, they've been faking videos. I've got evidence of it, um, a lot. You know, in friends' channels, in my own channel, um, of them faking things from the start. But now, um, it seems that they are actually well, not now. We know that they've been collaborating with these um, insurgents. And now Anderson Cooper, he um, was interviewing this guy called Danny, as you know, and. Um, your viewers would probably know that he, this Danny was caught faking an, an interview saying that he was under bombardment when really he was, uh, you know, in complete safety and he was actually faking sounds of shelling. And now Anderson Cooper um, tried to distance himself from Danny and saying, oh, you know, poor CNN, it hasn't been allowed into Syria and hence it has to rely on these uh, dubious sources. Well, actually, CNN was allowed into Syria. And this was at the time of the oil uh, refinery fire in Homs. And there was a video that was found um, that was set up by these insurgents facing the direction of the oil refinery fire 16 hours previous to the actual um, explosion that blew it up. And actually on this very same video, the voices of CNN journalists uh, Arwa Damon, I think her name is, and um, some of her colleagues were heard on this video. So n not only were they um, take, not only are they so skewed and faking interviews, they're actually collaborating with people who are committing terrorist 
uh, uh, bombings. And uh, I can't say how far this collaboration goes, but obviously they knew what was going to happen because they, they were there, you know, with, uh, with the camera. So um, this is not like new. If you remember in Libya, there was one CNN, um, actually I'm, I have to correct myself, it may not have been CNN, but there was one Western journalist who on her Twitter tweeted that she helped NATO that day because she directed them to a position um, of where to airstrike. So we're not really dealing with independent media here. We're dealing with enemy media. And some of these so-called media are spies. I know that um, in Syria, in the same team that Arwa Damon was with, we had a uh, former SAS agents. So these guys are, um, I think it's the Syrian government is actually right in being suspicious of the foreign media. And I'm actually, you know, given their history of supporting uh, militarily the um, invasions and whatnot, that um, they should be suspicious of the Western media. Sure, and so, just to be clear here, the United States has been hijacked by these big mega banks on record. The Economist, Financial Times of London, they brag, oh, Goldman Sachs has conquered Europe. So it's not like my country and even Israel or Australia or England want to attack Syria. No, it's just our name on it. The big mega oligarch banks are using our countries in NATO to go after your nation and selling us that it's humanitarian because, you know, Saddam threw babies out of incubators. Turns out that wasn't true or Saddam has WMDs or Gaddafi's got rape gangs out fueled by uh, Viagra. None of that was true. Anderson Cooper has them all on with classic bestial war propaganda. But Anderson Cooper is not an American. You know, Anderson Cooper is a globalist operative. So I want to be clear. It's not that, oh, I'm siding against America with Syria. I don't like Assad, just like your family got run out of there by Assad and locked up. The point is they're not trying to go in and throw Assad out to bring some type of freedom, but to loot the region and put Al Qaeda in charge, who've said they're gonna run out the Muslim minority groups and the Christians. So, it, I mean, they're going to put Al Qaeda in there. That's on record to wreck the place when it's an industrialized civilization. And it's the same thing with Iran. And it's Saudi Arabia, that corrupt, not the people of Saudi Arabia, but that a corrupt elite who is backed by the British Empire doing all of this. Israel's involved, not the Israeli people per, uh, I mean, 70 plus percent don't wanna attack Iran and Israel. But our media acts like Americans are traitors if we don't wanna attack uh, Iran. Well, the majority of Israelis don't. This is madness by the ruling class that wants all these wars and is overthrowing all these countries by proxy to loot them. Uh, do you agree with those statements or is there any tidbits you want to add to, you disagree? I absolutely agree with the majority. I might add a few tidbits. I want to uh, definitely uh, confirm and agree that, um, you know, our war, our fight is everybody's fight. You know, we're all fighting these bands. We're all fighting this ruling elite that happens to be crazy because um, we can see that they're crazy by the fact that they follow some strange religions and seem to want to um, put symbolism everywhere in the crimes that they commit. And, you know, it's not, it's not about um, uh, being behind Amer Syria um, and against America, no. It's about stopping um, the, the potential of a third world war. And the only people who are going to suffer are us, you know, all of us, people, civilians, um, soldiers, our, our families. So, you know, I totally agree. Our fight is, is your fight and your fight is our fight. So um, I also, I want to put out also with Israel, you know, I have um, no hatred towards any different people. And for me, the, the perfect solution would be to go back to the way things were, where Jews and Muslims and Christians were living in the, the old cities and in Syria, and th we had no problem whatsoever. And for me, you know, a one-state solution would be ideal, but that, that's a very, very long story, and I don't want to get into that. But um, with Assad and specifically, and you said also mentioned Saddam Hussein, they always try to create a caricature of like this evil boogeyman, you know, Osama bin Laden, Hitler, 
and so forth and so forth as the film Connie 2012 did Connie another one but with Assad it's, it's a little bit um, it doesn't quite mesh very well because even though the government of Syria might be very hard Bashar Assad himself is, is actually quite soft you know, he never actually intended to um, become president he was uh, an ophthalmologist Before they don't even deny that he was trying to reform the bureaucracy has been blocking him, correct? No, I, I don't think so. Well, actually, in before pre-2008, they had him coming to France. They, ha they had him, you know, like, uh, they were, they were preening and pro uh, trying to buy him away from Iran, basically, in so many words. And a part of that was, I guess, Angelina Jolie um, coming to Syria and, you know, all these articles coming out like oh you know these dictators are actually very mild blah 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 but at the, at the end of the day there was no way that syria or even bashar was gonna side with our enemies uh these you know owned governments uh, in europe against our ally iran so um from that point on they realized well that there's only so far that these reforms go, you know, he's not going to introduce a central bank, etc. So um, I guess from that day on, he was enemy number one. Well, before we went live here in the interview, you said that you wanted to bring up Angelina Jolie and the, you know, the points I'd made about her. Um, I mean, what's your view on what she's doing, calling for the invasion of Libya? She's got to feel good about the black genocide there and the 40 plus thousand dead. Uh, she's calling for the invasion of your country and the humanitarian bombing and the Al Qaeda attacks that she says are peaceful and loving. Um, Obama's saying he'll launch wars, the congressional approval now that he takes orders from NATO and the UN. Uh, what do you think of her in Coney 2012? Just all of it. The repackaging war now is loving and liberal, and uh, you're a traitor if you're not for destroying countries. Well, they've always uh, said war is peace, haven't they? So with Angelina Jolie, I was in Syria when she was there, and I should have been more suspicious when she was there. I mean, I, at, the, at the time, I actually didn't realize what she was. I thought, you know, she's just some just some, some actress. So I was like vaguely interested, oh, this might be good for tourism, you know. But then I heard that at that time that she, this might have been just a rumor, but that she was thinking about adopting a Syrian child. And actually, I remember feeling such um, rage at this thought because uh, it's, it's kind of a humiliation, I think. And I, I now realize how other uh, countries might feel. You know, no, it's, it's like war loot. It's like war booty. And as long as they've taken one of your children, then it's okay to carpet bomb you and overrun you with Al-Qaeda. So it's all like, look, I have a child I'm loving. It's a totally sick joke with her. In fact, we found she likes to adopt a child from any place she's later going to call for their destruction. So it's like a cute little joke. Well, luckily, um, either she wasn't allowed to take one or um, I don't or it was a rumor, rumor all along. I'm betting it was the former. But um, she's definitely, as, as you said, I completely agree with what you said about her. And I feel like she's more than just a useful idiot. And she also appeared in the Coney 2012 film saying, oh, you know, let's, let's find Coney, like, it's so, he's so evil, blah, blah, blah. And I actually have a, a, a long commentary on my YouTube channel about Coney 2012, and I don't want to repeat everything, but it's so um, clearly a, a very, very powerful piece of propaganda, but so clearly, a, you know, a psychological operation to try to get um, war to happen in Uganda. So um, I actually feel that it kind of imploded. It's it's very strange, you know. Um, it, it, there was this huge fanfare, and and now it's 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 also all these intellectual people are against it. There are other voices that are being heard. So um, you know, maybe it's a plus in the end. Well, the whole Coney 2012 thing, George Soros connected, State Department connected, all of it. I mean, this guy hadn't been seen in years, five, six years. That's the telltale sign. They just pick a boogeyman where he's there, and then they pass, tried to pass a resolution in Congress saying, we'll attack any country we want uh, on the name of Coney in Africa. I mean, it's so transparent 
but they got all these trendies hopping around going, it's liberal, it's liberal. I mean, how they've gotten normally liberal anti-war people now to be like vicious pro-war piranhas, uh, all because Obama's in. So you give him the peace prize, you have him launch all these wars and call it peace. I mean, it is sick. It's so ironic because the movie itself is discussing how terrible it is to use child soldiers, where they have um, images of all of these teenagers in T-shirts with machine guns on their shirts with a big banner down the bottom that says, we will fight. So it's, it's, it's a complete and utter um, in-your-face hypocrisy, warmongering. Um, I don't know what else to say about it. Uh, I guess um, the powers that be, you know, they worked hard on that one. But I don't know how far it's taken them. Uh, Osama bin Laden was a, uh, one of those boogeyman that was everywhere. They had a minion as well, Zarqawi, which they, they used in Iraq. And so many Iraqis were saying, uh, actually, we've never seen him. We've never heard of him. He's just another WMD. But America sure seems to know where he is at all times. And it's crazy how many uh, stories come out of him being killed somewhere or lost a leg. It just shows you that these people, whether they existed in one point or not, the creation, the character that they have of them is just a tool to um, create war, to uh, gain resources. And in, in the case of Africa, it's just to push China out of the way so they can get their own oil pipelines through. So um, that's, that's that about Kony, I guess. Syrian girl, I want to raise the Al-Qaeda attacks. I already mentioned those, but, but again, watching the rebels who've been attacking, I don't know, six, eight months, however long it's been now, from the beginning shooting and killing people, and then our controlled media that works for the big banks that have taken over America here in my uh, conquered nation, they just all happily go along with the fact that they are implying that military attacks are protesting. And then now we see Al Qaeda blowing things up. Um, what's your view on that? And and where do you see this whole situation going in Syria now that Russian ships are there and Russian troops have been deployed to the area? Well, um, on the Russian troops, I think uh, well the ships had been there since the beginning of the year, and they came uh, because actually the ships, French and Canadian ships from Libya had stayed in the Mediterranean, waiting for a chance to attack um, Syria. And, you know, I've heard people say that, oh, NATO hasn't attacked Syria because it doesn't have oil. Actually, you know, they've been trying to attack Syria since day one, but they've had uh, Russia blocking them. And, you know, we welcome the ships in the port. The, the soldiers are not um, even free reign in Syria. I actually, I'm... Um, the report initially of the soldiers being there is unconfirmed. I think the first source was Depka. So I'm not sure, but I, I feel that if there are soldiers anywhere in Syria, they would just be guarding the um, Russian boats themselves in that locality. But um, I think that, uh, you know, I, I trust that our Russian allies would um, support us if, if some crazy uh, war hawk just decides to uh, break resolution and attack. Um, back onto uh, the bombings and the so-called uh, peaceful demonstrations in Syria. You know, yeah, okay, I think there's been death squads in Syria um, doing what they've done in South America. Uh, if you've ever seen the film um, with the Venezuelan President uh, Chavez, uh, the revolution will not be televised. You'll see that actually the these outside forces were shooting at both protesters and police to try to instigate something. And the protesters were anti-Chavez protesters. So uh, they, this is a formula that's been used over and over and over again. And there, there are death squads in Syria um, and there's snipers firing at people, buying bread on the street, you know, just randomly at people mortar fire coming from nowhere, bombings, and yet we're supposed to believe this narrative that the, you know, only the government is just out killing everybody randomly for no reason whatsoever, and it's really evil, including protesters and uh, that are peaceful, and, you know, civilians. In reality, the protesters 
were very, very quickly armed from this start. You know, very, very, um, within a very short period of time, we saw uh, peaceful protesters and then armed, armed insurgency. So, um, well, that's how the Soviets in during the Cold War would do it a lot. They would come in in, in the next country they wanted to invade, and th th they would exploit the country they'd already taken over to send in rebels. They would call them protesters, have them rise up, and then have them invade, and then call for the Soviets to roll in backing them. And the Soviets would say, oh, we're backing a freedom revolution. So this whole proxy war thing is so criminal. And, and again, you can say what you want of the eye doctor, Assad, and, and oh, and the fact that the government of England then hacked their emails and released them. And I noticed Infowars.com was in there. I saw that in the Sydney Morning Herald uh, that uh, I guess it's Assad's father-in-law was like, here, Infowars seems to have it broken down. Look at this. So it's also, it shows that the Syrian government's probably not that sophisticated if they're having to figure out what's going on partially from Infowars.com. Uh, but I, I just don't want to see the Al-Qaeda flag, even though I'm supposed to love Al-Qaeda as an American, because Obama says so. I don't want to see Al-Qaeda, I know I'm unpatriotic, taking over your country. Thanks, we appreciate that. But um, we, yeah, we're not going to allow that to happen. That's what they want in the end, you know. The, I have uh, videos of these, uh, you know, parts of these insurgent forces and by and large, you know, they have the same kind of Salafist Wahhabi ideology as Al Qaeda. So um, there, there's I have videos of them holding up the Al Qaeda flag in, in on multiple occasions. So it's it's not really anything to be denied. Um, and actually, a, half of them. I'm not gonna, maybe not half. I can't really say percentages and whatnot. I don't have statistics, but um, a large portion of them are actually from outside of Syria and. Even the Western media has reported this. Oh, they yeah, no, no, no. In Libya, once they'd killed uh, Gaddafi, they were holding up signs saying, Syria, here we come. Damascus, here we come. I mean, it's it's clear. And they met up in Turkey talking about how they were going to come there. And the, it, Turkey and Jordan are where these people are trained. And there's actually images of uh, either mercenaries or uh, special forces Westerners uh, with a British flag on their side and very expensive Kevlar and American weapons. There's, we have images of them training these people in how to create bombs. So yeah, you mentioned George Soros and his, you know, humanitarian NGOs. Well, there's actually NGOs out there and they have websites and um, Syria has captured shipments of them of their uh, stuff to these insurgents and they include. Uh, walkie-talkies, and they've captured so many shipments of uh, weapons, including Israeli weapons. Um, so in the media, you hear things like, oh, the U.S. is discussing whether or not it will arm the insurgency. Actually, it's been armed since the beginning. Well, that's right. They the admit States. in Jordan, this is even been in the BBC and even Associated Press, there's U.S. troops right on the border at these camps arming them and then spilling them in. And then little CIA Anderson Cooper, who admits he's CIA, gets up and goes, I'm liberal. Oh, help everybody. Oh, help them. I mean, it's so, people think if somebody has a limp wrist that war is suddenly trendy. And that's all a camouflage with Anderson Cooper, that whole I'm a sweetie cake act. Oh, we've really got to help the protesters. I mean, it is so sick. Well, Syrian girl, we've uh, put your Twitter up on screen if folks want to contact you. From what I've seen, though, it looks like the tide is starting to turn against this Western-backed Al-Qaeda revolution uh, and that things uh, are really starting to reverse. Is that fair to say from your contacts in Syria? I definitely, definitely agree. Um, I'm still cautious of what might be uh, put against Syria next. I, f I feel like they want to start creating a civil war. So, you know, the way that they create a civil war is they continuously bomb uh, one side and then the other until even, you know, one person is idiotic enough to think, oh, actually, I was bombed by the other side. And that's all it takes to turn a fake civil war into a real civil war. So I feel this is their next step in Syria. This is what they're going to try to do. But I feel, you know, we're not going to go for it. We've already, um, Syria's already basically defeated 
the insurgency, the FSA. It's just these um, cells of, uh, you know, bomb makers that it now has well, to Well, that's be like that's like six years ago it was even in the British news. They caught SAS dressed up like Wahhabists driving around shooting Shiites and Shiite police trying to get a civil war going in Basra. It's full spectrum dominance. If you're going to be somewhere, you've got to be able to say there's the war. And so the, the, the bankers fund the terrorist and fund the insurrection as a pretext to be there. And now they've said they're going to start bombing um, uh, Damascus. And then the government's got to clamp down to stop that. And then they can say, oh, look, the government's authoritarian. This is pure manipulation. Uh, and uh, we'll continue to track it and watch it from here. Uh, be safe. Syrian girl, thank you so much for spending time with us. If I may make one last sentence, sure. I just want to say that um, there's a lot of talk in Syria that the emails, uh, the so-called Assad emails are not really his. Um, the names even on the email are not true. I just wanted to just say that because otherwise I'll regret not saying it. Oh, that's probably so the case. That, uh, that's probably the case. They probably put info wars in there to you know, go after us. I know they've done similar things to us in the past. Uh, who knows? I just saw that in the City Morning Herald. I don't know if you saw it a few weeks ago. And it was like, you know, Infowars.com and the emails. Uh, I mean, it wouldn't be the first time the establishment's uh, done stuff like that. Well, listen, thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Well, I was only going to go for about 15 minutes, but wow. Uh, amazing in-depth interview, not sound bites there. Uh, with the lady that goes for safety by Syrian girl. And she comes from one of the former ruling class families who didn't actually like uh, Assad's father. So there you go. But they don't want to see their country bombed and with all those love bombs that Obama likes to drop that Hillary's calling for, carpet bombing the country to, to, to protect the protesters, uh, the Al-Qaeda. And again, if you don't like the fact that I don't like Al-Qaeda, I don't care. I'm not for Al-Qaeda. And I know nowadays in America that's seen as extremist, that scene is bad. I don't want to ship guns to the Mexican drug lords like the White House does. I don't want to fund Al Qaeda. I just want freedom. I'm not for cancer viruses and the vaccines. I'm a bad guy. I'm an extremist. I want freedom. I don't want to devalue the dollar. I'm a bad guy again. Another bad guy is Billy Corrigan, founder of the Smashing Pumpkins. He's probably even more prolific when it comes to the fact he's one of the greatest living songwriters. So many of the big hits you hear Billy Corrigan wrote. And a great political mind uh, found out. A few years ago from um, Eric Mancal Muller, who he's friends with, that, he, that Billy's a listener. And uh, then I, I learned he was coming to South by Southwest and that we ought to talk to each other through uh, Mancal and hooked up with him two different nights with him and his girlfriend and really got a chance to get to know him. Amazing person and a very impressive interview, as you're about to see, certainly a newsmaker. So all you PrisonPlanet.tv viewers, be sure and get this out to everybody you know. And Lord willing... As it's always up to God, we'll see you back on the radio tomorrow, 11 a.m. Central, 12 noon uh, Eastern, and then back tomorrow night. I'll be here, InfoWars Nightly News. We've had our pit stop, and um, we've got our contest for two new reporters running. You've got a month until April 30th to get that in, and check all that out at InfoWars.com as well. The video's up on our YouTube channel. Um, that's it for the InfoWars Nightly News. I give you now the special report. Billy Corrigan in studio over an hour long interview. Tonight, we have a special guest in studio. Billy Corrigan, the founder of Smashing Pumpkins, uh, is in studio with us to talk about the media, music, what's happening right now, and what he sees in the future. Billy, great to have you in studio with us. Thank you, Alex. Happy to be here. Wow. Uh, you're here for South by Southwest. How are you liking it? It's a little crazy, <laughs> as you know, as an Austin person. It's a, all of a sudden, all the beard people showed up. <laughs> the trendies, as you call them, right? Lots of trendy showed up with beards and white vans. I did notice that. And, and, and like pastel pinks and greens. Yeah. Prancing. <laughs> I didn't see that, but um, I, I, I did see a lot of people like this with the cell phones, you know. 
So. Oh, and they walk out in front of traffic? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's good to have you here. Uh, tell us about the speech you were here giving, and you had a little run-in with Al Gore. I did. I did. Well, technically speaking, I made the president, the vi former vice president, wait for me, um, <laughs> which was pretty funny. Um, it's a little payback for for <laughs> something from the past. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I was here at uh, a uh, conference, uh, social media, and how it's changing the business models. Um, in essence, it's essentially revolutionizing the business models because the consumer's, in essence, talking back. And so uh, it's about where, where the music industry has sort of gotten it wrong in the last 10 years. When, when you know, with the rise of Napster, the, the music business kind of covered their ears and thought it was all going to go away. And it's uh, really hollowed out the music business in many ways. And so um, there, is, there is a movement there that needs to be headed. Um, I'm not saying I'm the head of it, but I'm, I'm part of a, a core group artist that wants to come back to where uh, artistic expression and integrity is sort of at the core of the music business. It was a good business model for a long time. There was there were a lot of flaws, but essentially a lot of great work was created. And now you talk to most people, particularly 20 year olds, they're just not very uh, connected to their music because the corporate aspect of it and the and the message behind it is really alienated a lot of people. And they've turned to other things. They turned to video games. They turned to but you know music no longer has that sort of special place in the culture. It, it has, you know, seemed to lose that real rebel quality that you saw across the board in music just 20 years ago. We were talking about that at dinner last night. How did that happen? Well, I think any time uh, you have a c c corporate interest it becomes the dominating theme. I mean, it's a central theme of what you talk about in your broadcasts where corporate interest has taken over America. I mean, you can go back to the founding fathers of America. They were working their own corporate interests. I mean, it had a lot to do with the decisions they made in, 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 in Philadelphia in the late 1700s. But it was balanced against a set of constitutional rights and the idea that, well, this particular model, a free model, a great society is going to yield a greater result. And as you like to point out many times, I mean, America was an incredibly uh, successful experiment for a long time. It evolved. And then somewhere along the way, we've kind of just gone like that, where corporate uh, interest has completely taken over our political structure. And it's also taken over our musical structure where you have, I mean, yes, it's a business. As somebody once said, it is a music business. But when it, when it, when it is the prime driving force, well, then, of course, you're going to get into things that are salacious and, and in essence, uh, overtly negative to the culture because they're just serving a particular interest. And there is a point where we all have to be responsible for our community standard. We all have to be responsible for the messages we put out. I mean, I've said lots of crazy things, done a lot of crazy things, but I've always had an intention in the back of my mind that something I was doing or the collective amount of things that I was doing were going to help somebody somewhere. If, if, you're all, if your complete intention is, is to do nothing but profit on the backs of others, well, then you, you know where that's going to go. You mentioned the founders, and I think you really brought up a point that I've thought about a lot but never articulated, but reading their writings and what they did, they were inventors, they were really into knowledge, and sure, they were you know, corporate businessmen, but they were really into the fact that we're so confident, we're so smart, we're not intimidated by other people having freedom. They were kind of in and, and talked about this wild experiment of freedom, and you look at the corporate structures globally today, they are scared to death of any freedom. And so they're stifling that, and I think that's really uh, pretty simple, but at the same time, it's complex. Well, I, I think uh, from a political standpoint, anywhere where you see dissent being stifled, wh where is the fear? I mean, or, or should I say, why is the fear there? Um, most people I talk to that would say have a problem with the government, they don't sit around and talk about anarchy or overthrowing the government. They just want to see a government that represents... Uh, their sort of uh, community uh, value. And, and, and I'm not necessarily one side or the other. You know, I, I, I've got people in my family that are total right-wing Republicans. Some of them are probably even racist. But they, they at least have a particular opinion that they're coming from that is rooted in their own belief system. When all you have is corporate interest driving something, well, then it's got nothing to do with belief. It's about looking at you and saying, how can I strip this man or this woman or this family of their resources? And that particular aspect is sort of haunting to us as Americans, because even if we were raised in propaganda, which you and I probably were, we were at least raised to believe America is a great country. It represents these values. 
you know, we freed the slaves, we, you know, we helped uh, uh, stop the Holocaust. You know, we, we, we grew up with a sense of personal ethic about what our country represents. The corporate globalism is so cold-blooded, it's so robotic. Well, yeah. <laughs> and I mean, you address it, you know, with, with great frequency. And I think, um, I, I, I use that word again, there's sort of a haunting feeling. It's like, like, I get it. Like, I get you want to make money, you know, I get you want to sell me something. But it's, it's when it's at the expense of my community, when it's at the expense of the values of the people around me. And, you know, people don't even talk to their neighbors. And they're all so locked into this. We talked about last night, kind of a narcoleptic state where the TV is enough or the computer is enough. Um, that's a scary thing, I, you know, and so there is a, a connection there between uh, kind of uh, stifling dissent, uh, you know, uh, what did Obama say coming in, I want to run this great uh, open government, transparent was I believe the word they used, and, and now you've seen where they, they go out of their way to stifle dissent. It's, I don't, the, it's the most closed government. Right, but, I, but what I say from an artistic point of view, and as somebody who's been in the media and at the top levels of media, and of course I know plenty of things that go on behind the scenes, uh, why are we so afraid of that dissent? You know, what, what is the problem? I mean, isn't that the point of a democracy? You're supposed to have a kind of a riotous debate about who's right. Um, there should, it should be an uncomfortable conversation. There should be kind of a, I, that's the whole point. Exactly. They're always saying, well, you can have your free speech as long as it's not uncomfortable. Or as long, as long as it's 300 feet down the road yeah. <laughs> away from where the limos go in the, in the back door, you know. But, but it, it is the uncomfortable speech. That's what's really important. Yes, and that's why I appreciate what you're doing. I, I think you raise a lot of points that are uncomfortable, but they're necessary towards the greater dialogue about where our country is at the moment and where it's going. And of course, as, as alternative media, which you know, you're a pioneer in, as it reveals a different narrative than we've been sold, there's an uh, awareness and awakening that goes on because you start looking at history and go, okay, wait a second, that thing I was told about this, maybe that's not so true. And then you start looking at things from a different point of evaluation. I, I think the biggest mistake we all make is trying to find a form of absolutism. There is no one truth. There is no one definitive black and white answer. It is always going to be sort of shades of gray. I just have a hard time understanding why there's this fear that's rising up around the discussion. And that, to me, that's a, that's, a big, that's a big red flag. Well, the system knows that as it consolidates power, people subconsciously are smart and understand there's a threat. So the system is very adept at projecting people's natural anxiety over things going in the wrong direction onto some boogeyman. And, and, the, and the social engineers, they know that. Uh, we, we talked a lot when we went to dinner last night, Billy, about media tricks or trying to keep people in the box. And, you know, when you were speaking about it, you know, all these data points were coming to my mind. It was, you, I mean, you were absolutely on target with how they're trying to control reality. Speak to that. Well, um, I can use my own example. Um, you know, I'm essentially lower middle class. You know, no one from my family went to college. I obviously have some gifts that are valuable. Um, the minute I entered into a, a bigger, uh, wider swath of media, I was sort of categorized. And when I resisted the categorization, I was demonized. You know, now somebody would say, well, that's just rock and roll. But having been in that game for 20 years, there is this overt pressure to put yourself in that particular narrative. And if you won't, you will be sort of labeled and tagged. And uh, it's fascinating for me now to go back and read articles about myself from 18 years ago where I'm sort of being put into categories and labeled a certain way. And, and then it's that weird thing of it's like a Kafka. You know, you're accused of a crime. You don't know what you did that was so wrong. And then you spend the rest of your life defending it. And, um, and so I'm very keen to watch how other people are demonized from uh, media entry points. When somebody rises up with a grand new idea, the way it's either co-opted you know, like, oh, let's say, let's, let's assume um, for the sake of argument that the Occupy movement started as an organic expression of somebody, you know, somebody said, let's do this, 10 people, four people. You saw right away where it was co-opted, you know what I mean? Uh, or, or other media forces tried to disclaim it and distance. And those are the ways that the media sort of tries to take things that they can't control and put it in a box. And then they start to write, they write the articles, what does this mean? Uh, uh, Bloomberg comes out and says, uh, Occupy New York is bad for business. 
So the common person says, oh, that's hurting us. Well, in the greater expression of freedom, maybe it's a good thing that we're having this dissent. Maybe the small downside of blocking traffic or something in the, in the greater whole is a necessity. Exactly. I mean, if America, 5% of the world population developed half the wealth because it had more freedom than anybody else, not that we were perfect, then how is it bad that people are exercising their liberty. Even if they don't have all the answers, at least they're trying to get involved. So the real question is, why is Bloomberg demonizing it? Or, 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 the, or the way Homeland Security coordinated to try to take down everybody's protests, you know? I think those are all a really bad, big red flag. Why are they so scared of people even exercising their First Amendment? That's a really... Uh... That's a question I don't have the answer for. I think it's one of those things where you can only look at the reaction to gauge that there, there must be really something vital going on or there wouldn't have been such a, an anti, there wouldn't have been such a violent reaction against the Occupy movement if what the Occupy movement was, was representing in a, as a whole wasn't threatening to somebody. You know, and that's why they try to sort of categorize it down into boxes. It's bad for business. Uh, it could lead to violence. It hasn't yet, but it might. You know, this kind of implied nuance. Yet, it was mostly just a bunch of people in tents, you know. And I, I particularly didn't agree with all of the Occupy message. I, I, I'm not here to wave the flag for it. I think there's certain aspects of troubling, troubling aspects about it, particularly the idea of wealth distribution. You know, in my particular instance, you know, my, I came from a family that didn't have anything. Everything I've earned in life, I made myself with songs that I wrote. So when somebody starts talking about how I've got to give to somebody that didn't do that, well, that's a, that's a deeper conversation. It doesn't mean I don't have a social concern. It doesn't mean I don't want to contribute to charities. It doesn't mean I don't want to help my fellow man. But if you look at Austin, where I live, all these young kids of middle class or wealthy they don't appreciate anything on average because it was all given to them. And again, it's America's not been perfect, but it's been better than most other systems because it was an avenue that allowed your natural gifts to be expressed. Whereas in an old world model, it was completely shut down by the elite. And that's what I found is that you have these crony capitalists who are really anti-free market, anti-libertarian ideas, and they basically are trying to get a big government system so that they have government power to shut down their competition. I think it's a really valid point. Um, I can only speak from my perspective as an artist because, um, you know, there's different terms that you can use. You know, outlier is one of them. You know, if you exist sort of outside of a given system, and I've been in the system, I've been outside the system, and now I'm probably standing right on the edge of the system, um, it's still, it's, you know, like you and I were talking about it today. Uh, I did a, a thing, this thing at South by Southwest where I gave an hour talk with an author who's uh, an expert in social media. Um, he's written this book. Uh, Brian Solis is his name. We had a one-hour discussion in front of 1,500 people, and the headline reads, Billy Corgan rants. You know what I mean? I don't understand how that's a rant an hour discussion, a sober discussion with two intelligent people about a very complex set of ideas, opinions included, that's not a rant. But that's that kind of language that gets encoded in. Don't be too smart, don't step outside, don't stand for anything. And I think what I really see with young people now is they want to, they're, they, they're responding to passion. And so uh, us as people getting a little older in life, we have to help direct that passion. Uh, and, 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 and what I love, uh, uh, for me, when you really hit the right target is when you talk about liberty and, and what liberty really means, the responsibility of liberty, the responsibility of freedom. It's not just this utopian anarchy. We have a responsibility to each other. What is that responsibility? Well, that's a, that should be an open debate. What is your responsibility as a, as a man, as a parent, as a citizen of Texas to your community, to the people who work here in your business? What is your responsibility? You have to address all those things. You have to openly debate them within your own mind, and then you're enough of a, of a humanitarian or a, an insane person or whatever. You want to take those ideas into the marketplace uh, to be bandied about. That's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. You know, even if I disagreed with 99% of what you were saying, I agree with why you believe in what you're doing. I agree with many things you say, but what I really respect is that you're willing to put yourself into the center of that argument 
and make that because that is what our country is supposed to be about. Our country is supposed to be about innovation, supposed to be about intelligence. We're supposed to be the, even uh, what was a uh, old Bush, uh, we're the, the beacon on the hill. Okay, well, are we the beacon on the hill? Well, we should be. Instead, we become a beacon for torture and empire and lies and propaganda. How did we go from, on average, putting out you know, the, the, the most informed people, the most patents, innovation, trailblazing? I mean, the world said, wow, America's it, to now the world says, man, this is where the evil comes from. I don't know. I mean, <clears throat> you know, you can make an argument that if you want to put the evil in quotations, that the evil's been there all along. You know, we, we engaged in slave trade at some point. At some point, we, we, you know, we took advantage of the Native Americans. We broke treaties. You know, as you said, we haven't been perfect. We're a rolling big ball of you know, dust, like peanuts, you know, like Linus, you know. Um, I think that's it. I think it's that we've had, we've been good and evil. And because we've been powerful, when we do shine, it's wonderful. But when we're dark, it's very, very bad. Yeah, I think it's a dark time. Um, and, and I think... Uh, you know, as somebody who listens, you know, uh, what we all need to do is we need to start looking at what success looks like. You know, you use the term info war, you know, right? So what is, what is victory in the info war? Right now, at some point, just resisting seems like victory because there's so little dissent. <laughs> it's shocking. If you and I could go back in a time machine to the 1960s when people were protesting what they were protesting, that, 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 uh, generation would be shocked at how little dissent there is right now. What are we in? Not nine wars, seven wars? Yeah, well, drones. Well, 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 proxy wars. It's like fourteen. Yeah. Okay. And 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 drones in eleven countries. I mean, where is this sort of dissent? And particularly, I, I would say from the artistic community. You know what I mean? And I'm including myself in this uh, 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 criticism. Where is the artistic reaction? In the 1960s, you had Neil Young, Ohio, and you had these great protest songs. Blowing in the Wind was a protest song. Where is the artistic response? It's almost like there's a giving up. But, but as you... No, no, but I would say this, Alex, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but, you know, there's, there, there, is a, there is a relationship that exists between performer and an audience or, you know, a, a, a singer in the song, right? At some point, and this is where I, I'm trying to answer your question, there isn't the hunger in the audience for that message. You understand? I could make an album of protest songs. There's not an audience that wants to hear that. In fact, oftentimes when I've used, like, say, my Twitter account to lodge a protest or lodge a point, um, I get this response back that says, just be quiet and entertain. So the role of the entertainer as a social icon or uh, an agent for social change has been diminished. And I don't think that's by accident. <laughs> Because, because the people in the late 60s, like Neil Young, like John Lennon, they had a tremendous amount of power with the counterculture and with the youth. And maybe there's a reason there that the people like that have been pushed aside to where that message is no longer uh, necessary or required. <clears throat> a lot of people feel like, don't tell me what to do. That's sort of the general vibe in the, in the, in the culture. But then I say, okay, if, if, if you don't want me to tell you what to do, that's totally fine. But what do you stand for? And most people don't have an answer. That's what I'm saying. At least in your case, you're saying, I stand for liberty. And you'll interpret your own version of that. And I have a version that's different than yours, right? But at least we stand for the common idea of liberty. I mean, I'm, I'm a beneficiary of, of one of the great countries in, in the history of the world. I'm some weirdo that figured out how to do something, and there was a system in place that allowed me to rise up and do it. If I'd grown up in Soviet Union or whatever, I probably would be working on a dock, right? So I appreciate that part of it. But it's weird to me when you have an audience that's basically turned that, that social icon into nothing more than a prop that's like a wind-up toy. We talked about that, the change in the people, that, that, you know, that state of just a malaise or a type of sleeping narcolepsy. I repeat to the viewers out there the experience of the way people have changed, because I've seen this in the last 10 years, the way fans have changed. Well, <clears throat> I've really noticed that um, social networking, uh, you, know, uh, you know, those types of things, Facebook, that's become sort of people's pride, okay? So little things you see. Uh, I used to sign a lot of autographs, sign almost no autographs now. Now it's a picture because the social uh, uh, approval comes from, look, I met this celebrity, here's the picture to prove it. 
It's not a physical document, it's a, it's a virtual document. Well, the same thing happens in your interactions with people. I'm no longer a real person most of the time. When they talk to me, it's kind of like, <laughs> you know what I mean? They've grown up with you, and, but you're sort of like, you're, you're, as, you're as real as this table or something. It's like, there's this- Well, to repeat your words, you said before it was, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Corrigan, but I really like you to sign this. I really you know, like your work. And you're like, hey, Billy, let's do a photo. It, 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 and my wife said this years ago, just in my own interactions. She's like, wow, it's like they know you, and it's like automatic. It's like, hey, and they just grab on you. Yeah, but it's the, it's, it's, it's the downside of the virtual reality. You know, somebody could sit there and watch 24 hours a day of my band or me talking on YouTube. So there's a there's a level of familiar, familiarity that comes with that. But then there's also this degrading of, uh, let's call it, uh, social structure. I grew up in a, uh, a world that you, 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 if you didn't know somebody, you, you referred to them as sir, you were formal at first, and all that's been stripped away. Now, that's not a huge indication of something. No, but it bums me out. When I say sir to people, they act like, I'm almost lower class that I'm groveling to them instead of, no, I'm giving the respect because I want it. Yeah, it, it, there's an erosion of uh, respect for the family, an erosion for the, of the formality of life, which I never saw as a bad thing. And I mean, like people will say, oh, what do you watch on TV? I said, I don't watch anything except a few sports because I can't stand to watch the American male be uh, uh, whatever they've turned the American male to. Castrated. That's a good word for it. I can't, I can't stand it. I mean, I just can't watch that anymore. Well, they put that image out. I mean, that's in the documents on purpose. And, and I don't cover that enough, but I think that's one of the hearts of their system is to turn women, you know, they claimed it was feminism, but now it's total objects. Dude, don't you think it's weird just to bring up a current event? Um, all of a sudden, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm certainly no fan of Rush Limbaugh. But again, I live in a society that's supposed to respect free speech. Okay, so that's his free speech, right? All of a sudden, there's articles... Uh, Gloria Steinem, fire Limbaugh, you know, now I heard you once talk about her and, and I did the research and there's all that stuff about her and the CIA and dating Kissinger and you're like, not trying to empower women, but get them as taxpayers and take their kids. It's cold blooded. I, I don't have that. I mean, I don't, I, I don't do the research like you do, so I don't know that. But, but I'm saying is it's funny to me how these people pop up in the narrative all of a sudden when there's an agenda. You know what I mean? No, you're right. And, yeah. and, and, and you're wise enough, and I've learned over time, to see beyond the narrative that's presented. The surface. Because the surface is usually not the story that they want told. And, and that's where um, the Bill O'Reilly's and the Rush Limbaugh's don't realize they're, they're just cogs in a much bigger system. And, and of course, they amassed tremendous wealth. And yeah, power. they promote Limbaugh because he fits in, but now they're wanting to get rid of him. Breitbart dies. They're trying to arrest Rupert Murdoch right now. Mm -hmm. They're going, and I predicted because I could see the move. Mm -hmm. And I said, watch, purges are going to start. And there is a purge against kind of the old right. They want just one big, weird, fake left thing that's launching wars, uh, erasing liberty, but calling itself the left. Which lends legitimacy to the old left that this new corporate board wants to cover itself with a mantle of the left, you see? Yeah. Yeah, well, I can say this much. I have noticed, um, you know, being a musician and growing up with a musical father, um, you know, you tend to be around a lot of liberal people, you know, and, and <laughs> drugs seems to be a part of that culture. But anyway, it's a liberal culture, right? Uh, and, and tend to mean lean more left. Growing up in the 70s, that was a more left-leaning thing. It's very weird to me that the left has become the old right in terms of they don't want to hear ideas, they don't want any dissent, they don't want any questioning. And, that, and so when people say, well, what is your political leaning? I certainly can't identify with that left anymore because that's, I see that now as the party of be quiet and get in line. Well, that's it. You've got the mainline right wing that's just trying to suppress libertarians and people that want some semblance of freedom mm -hmm. and then haters. It's you know, a mix of people. And then you've got the left that is just totally sold out to trendiness and feeling like we're good and liberal, not actually standing up for what's right. Yeah, and, and here's where you, you would probably laugh, where I've been attacked the most for expressing any particular opinion, you know, outside of my world, um, is if I question in any way the global warming, climate change narrative. That is the most virulent attacks that I've seen from people if I question that. It is like... I, I mean, you'd think I was skinning babies alive. You know, how dare you attack the earth? <laughs> and all I'm saying is these are very serious issues.
worthy of open debate. You know, you if you do research, uh, I do my own research. You're not my only informational source. I'll go on and I'll see uh, climate figures, and this one scientist says this, and this other. So you think, well, okay, it's not a settled issue, right? But in this guy's mind, it's a settled issue, and I'm against the planet Earth because I dared question carbon taxes or something, you know. And but I, the reason I'm bringing this up is not uh, to to make a point about myself. The reason it's 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 amazing to me that where you have a lot of corporate money sitting behind something, how can a liberal class be that comfortable with that relationship? With the amount of money that's behind the green movements, how can that liberal class be that comfortable? Shouldn't they be going? Well, why is this? You know, why is Monsanto standing behind me on this? That's where it gets a little fishy. For but look at the genius, Billy. Mm -hmm. They're, they're cutting down the rainforest, they're in genetic engineering everywhere, they're splicing all the species, they're building nuclear reactors, they're leaking everywhere. So of course the mega corporations who could care less are going to fund the left and take control of the green movement so it's not about all those real issues, it's about carbon dioxide that plants live off of that you exhale, that way they can tax it and then steal it as corporate welfare. What I found is the big mega corporations, they lobby for high taxes on the general public and on Main Street because A, they're exempt from it, and B, they're getting it in bailouts and contracts. Mm -hmm. That's the genius. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the scale on the dragon's belly where you can shoot the arrow yeah. is that when you actually explain to someone who's well-meaning and cares about the environment, okay, um, 160 plus countries are exempt from carbon taxes, but Europe and the U.S. and Australia and New Zealand aren't. And they're going to build three power plants a week in China, but shut them down here. They're going to have more carbon going out there. How, how does more carbon? And they, they don't know what to say. You're like, oh, so it's about a power grab. And then once you show people the backside of those tricks, right. then it's, it's all laid bare right there. But again, that's why the media that you've been on the inside of and seen wants to dumb it down. Because as long as they can say, Coney 2012, there's a bad guy in Africa invade, doesn't matter if the actual invasion bill in Congress says every country in Africa. Mm -hmm. It just it just feels good, Billy. Yeah, that's why I think um, you know you know you're savvy in these matters. I'm certainly not, but I know enough about these systems to know to to look beyond the the narrative that's being addressed. And the, and and if because I know how these things work, somebody's going to watch this and say he's just a singer. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I don't know what I'm talking about, but I do know this much. If you don't have a rigorous debate around any issue, that's a red flag. Because what's to be so afraid of? <laughs> that's my point. And where you see the lack of dissent in America and the suppression of an alternate voice, people calling for, you know, regulation of the web, you know, the internet quill switch, these are all really troubling signs because we're moving towards a sort of an agreed upon idea that no one's really agreed upon. Because the agreement can only come if there's rigorous debate, and there isn't rigorous. Debate. They create false consensus. Well, they create they create a false debate. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? It's a, a dumb artist versus a wacko guy who lives down here and thinks he knows what's going on, right? And that's the way they would marginalize us. Not a passionate person who's done a lot of investigation and self-made person who's you know, has some level of intelligence to look at the world from a particular angle, one of which is I've been allowed access into different corridors of power because of my success. I, I think the fact that you've been successful is the evidence of the fact we should listen to you. Look, I have seen this, and I'll actually take one issue with what you said. Well, I'm just a singer, and sure, what do I know? Most of the experts this appeal to authority that you see on the news, they don't tell you. You can look up each and every pundit. They have got a whole combine a whole special interest behind them with a talking point, and they're there. I mean, you, I could find a hundred academics right, for I, every I, academic they push. If I ever watched one of those shows, right, the minute it says foundation for, you know, one, I, that's it. I don't listen to that person. If they're a self-made person, you know what I mean. Then they're worthy because no, that's who you. So, so you do have credibility. All right. Well, I, have I mean, you've run businesses, you've produced music, you've you've had staying power for twenty years. I think I have credibility as an American. That would be my point. That exactly. But but I'm just saying we always have this self-deprecation of, well, I'm just a radio talk show host, mm -hmm. you know. Like, well, well, I can go look up that the entire crew of the Coney 
you know, 2012 movement is government funded and controlled mm -hmm. and that they want to and, and, and that the White House says it's going to be their plan to invade Africa. Mm -hmm. So right there, I don't have to be a Ph.D. in something. If I catch somebody in bed with my wife, mm -hmm. I know they're on top of her in bed. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see what I'm saying? No, I, I completely understand. And that's what I'm trying to say is and that's one of the reasons I, I, I wanted to uh, come here is is is, you know, because because like let's say I, I let's say there's uh, fans that have never come into contact with you, you know, and they do some exploration and they're going to come in contact with ideas that they're not familiar with. My point is 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 not to get locked into the to the idea of whether you're right or I'm right or you're wrong and I'm wrong. It's to it's to be okay with letting those ideas onto the table and not be afraid of exploring them. Now, if you as an individual listen to your ideas and you say, I just don't get it, I don't resonate with that. Then you should follow your own heart. You're, you're, you know. What I mean, we're humble enough to admit that we're just men, right? Imperfect and, and flawed in our own way. All I'm trying to say is we shouldn't be afraid of the debate. The debate is necessary because if everything's so great, <laughs> why do most of my family feel the pressure of the economy? You know, they keep talking about how the job numbers go up. Well, not in my family. <laughs> totally fake numbers, but I think you've hit a deep truth here, Billy, and that it's simply getting outside the box. It's accepting other ideas, not being threatened by them, and really having a real discussion. And why in this modern system is that so taboo? That is un-American, it's anti-human, it's anti-Renaissance, it's anti-common sense, and that is something no one can disagree with. Anybody that calls for shutting down ideas, anybody that calls for narrow parameters, they're the enemy of humanity. Exactly. So let's use the Coney thing as an example. I've read things and saw things that you talked about with the Coney stuff. I want to do my own investigation on it, right? Uh, you've told me what you thought about it. Um, I know to not just take the, the, you know, let's call it the mainstream narrative of that story. Now I also know that many of my fans are invested in the story. How do I know? They Twittered me about it. They asked me to get involved, be part of the, the chain of people that were spreading the information on the documentary. I haven't watched the documentary myself. If it's a propaganda piece, I want to see it with my own eyes. If it's something that actually touches me. Where the stupidity will come in is somebody say, well, don't you care about children in Africa? Or don't you care about what? Of course I do. I'm a human being. But these are very complex uh, ideas, oftentimes, and if we if we break them down into their into their micro, we miss the macro. And in the macro, there's obviously something going on globally that should be is 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 a far greater danger to humanity than any particular issue. So we have to be human enough to both address the micro issue, but we can't take our ball off the macro. You know. For example, um, you know, w one thing I just shake my head on, and I and I'm probably wrong in the statistics, but like what's going on with Greece with the with the with the debt deals, uh, as far as I know, and and if I'm wrong, I'm sure I'll hear about it. But they had to sell their lottery. They had to sell. They're giving away islands now, and then you then you find out. I read from reading different economists that 90 percent of that debt is is, is paper debt, right? It's it's it, it's well, well, yeah. Goldman Sachs got their president and finance minister to back up the banker's debt. So they're selling everything to prop up the too big to fail. Yeah. But then you can understand why somebody in Greece is sitting there saying, OK, we supposedly owe all this money, but yet, you know, it's not like we got all these roads built or these schools and we went crazy. It's not there's nothing to really show for it's it. total fraud. So that's where that's where you have to look and say something's going on systemically in the in the global system. That's very troubling. You see these things come up, and if you pay enough attention, and and, and certainly read outside the American media, you, I mean, if you read European media, I mean, there's a great concern for what's. Oh, they admit it's the bankers engineered this. It's a coup, and but they're holding us hostage. What do we do? The, I mean, the Europeans actually are informed and want to know the truth. And back to the Coney thing. Day one, George W. Bush is endorsing it. Well, I mean, this is a known war criminal. I mean, so right there, okay, George Soros is involved. Okay, the State Department's involved. Okay, this guy hadn't been seen in five and a half years. Okay, they want this oil. Okay, and then you find out the whole story. It's just a, there's a bad man, we're invading Africa, and the average American doesn't even know where Africa is. So it's just like, oh, our troops are over there fighting that bad man. And, and that's where the lack of debate and just this one-dimensional 
of we're the good guys. And that's why I was saying I appreciate the, the alternative uh, viewpoint that you bring into this because that's what needs to happen. It needs to be measured against the other ideas that are come. Because most of the, if, if I was to say, uh, if I was going on my Twitter and say, okay, why do you care about the Coney thing? The number one thing is kids, uh, Pe women being abused, raped, mutilation. So it's where it's where those uh, negative systems, if we can quantify them as that, take real human desire to want to help something, the oppressed and the you know, and then it gets mixed into an agenda. And so if you try to put yourself in the middle of that agenda. Um, you know, you'll be attacked as somebody as being unsympathetic, unsympathetic enough. Exactly. They use the one-dimensional nature instead of saying, "Okay, these global corporations have been caught killing a hundred times that, and they certainly don't care about these populations. They've used these emotional appeals, waving the bloody yeah. shirt." Well, over uh, and over again, are we going to take the bait again? But I get it. They're going to then attack you and say, you're not a nice man. You want to hurt the children. I don't want to hurt the children. That's what I'm saying. Is, And that's why I would say to anybody who, who's one of my fans is, is where you turn the corner on this is not to be afraid of the ideas. You take the ideas onto your own table. You discuss them with your family, your wife, and then you make your own decision. Exactly. Don't let somebody else make that's a decision. That's it. That's it. I'm not here to advocate your position or my position. I'm here to advocate the concept of liberty, right? And we're two people are expressing it in different ways. I express it through music, you express it through a, a vigorous political, social debate. The ancients, get back to the Greeks, as you know, called it the wisdom of the street or the common man. Kind of that general consensus throughout cultures has been decided that's the best place. And before we did this interview tonight, you were bringing up John Lennon and he had that street credibility Speak to that. Well, I think it's really interesting in 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 the in the rearview mirror now. We know that the was it the CIA or the FBI? Which, Both. Okay. Well, they they had their eyes on him. Why did they have their eyes on John Lennon? Here's a guy saying, "All you need is love," because when when a person amasses enough individual power outside of a system, they're dangerous. They're dangerous to that system. And that's, that's why I think there's a systemic level of control, whether it's put in at the entry level, the mid-level, or the top levels, or all levels, to kind of try to keep people like that marginalized, you know? And, and I think now we're going to be seeing the digital form of that marginalization. You know, you call them hit pieces. Well, there's, there's the, now there's going to be the digital version of that. You know? Well, what they do is they create an artificial grassroots movement mm -hmm. that wants to help children and really it's a cover for a giant continent-wide invasion for resources. I, I, in that particular instance, you know, I hope that you're wrong and I hope that it is about children and I hope that it is about uh, humanitarian thing. The problem is we have plenty of history to indicate <laughs> that that's not always the case. You're right. And that's why, that's why your ideas about it should be taken into that debate and examined and not feared because it seems to be counter to a humanitarian idea. If you can look at your concepts in the macro, you're saying, if, if this is what goes on, you know, we'll save more children, we'll help more people if we clean these systems up. If we get caught up in the micro debates, you know, that's why we get into this rigidity in our country and it gets really dumbed down and the public discourse goes down to, you're an idiot. Well, that's what I've learned is that if they left African countries alone on average and let them use their own resources, Africa would be a jewel. But Western corporate interest, no, they can just go wreck a country, fund rebels, or fund the neighbor to attack, and then come in and get it for nothing. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sure you read Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Oh, yes. Is it John Perkins yes. is the author? That's a fantastic guide from somebody who was in that system that talks about how uh, Western corporate interests come in and exploit the, the people of Africa. Exactly, and he talks about how they'd have a PR article, you know, in the New York Times, Washington Post, about how the person was a war criminal, even if they weren't as a way to just depose them. And so, I mean, that's the thing. The globalists follow the same models over and over again. Well, because they work. <laughs> exactly. So it's like, oh, I've seen this. How do you know a 57 Chevy? You see it over and over again. Yeah. And then, and then you see the trendies getting conned by it. You see everybody going through the same motions. And it's just so frustrating to see it happening. Well, the quote that I always think about having been in this media system for over 20 years is it's either Schopenhauer or Kant but it's something along the lines and I'm sure I got it wrong but it's like first they ignore you then they try to destroy you then they try to co-opt you or buy you in and then they claim you 
And I think that's a really good guide for anybody to look at any public figure. I don't care who they are, an actor, a playwright. That system does come into play at some level. And, uh, and I think that, that until that system is eradicated, um, there's a struggle there that, ta that taps a key human resource, which is innovation, and sort of p puts it through, a, through something that is ultimately serving somebody else's interest. And I think that, um, you know, you have, you have books that, uh, is it The Fountainhead or uh, the Ayn Rand, uh, yeah. Ayn Rand, you know, where she basically talks about that particular blueprint. And I've read interesting information to suggest that she was Illuminati and she was expressing some sort of other deeper blueprint. It's an interesting debate to consider. But as somebody who's thrived on the, on, the, on the largest stages in that, somebody who's taken himself off that stage and somebody who's readdressing it now from a different, more humanistic, uh, di a hu more humanistic angle, um, I can say that, that it pains me now, at my age, now I'm going to be 45, to watch where young, talented people are put into that meat grinder from the get-go. And they're put into it now at, a, at a, an accelerated rate that's sort of unprecedented and the technology is in many ways aiding aiding and abetting that system so it's up to us to be a little bit more cautious because we right now america needs young people to be smart we need them to be debating we need them to be protesting for things that really matter and not getting caught up into quasi side arguments like wealth distribution <laughs> because that's really not the, that's really not the argument you know what i mean exactly the 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 debate should be how to generate wealth not how we're going to redistribute it uh, I was reading that at South by Southwest, I guess yesterday or so, you challenged some of the people there about stop trying to be so cool or trendy. What did you mean by that? Well, I think what happens is, um, you know, in my particular world, um, trendiness has now become part of the business model. And you have a lot of websites that exist, let's call it in, in an independent tier, um, that have gone into business where creating exclusivity principles, you're not cool enough to listen to this band. We know what's cool. That's become part of the business model. But what it's done is it's hurt the overall creativity of the business, and it's also cr hurt the, the ability for a young artist who maybe starts in an independent world um, because they're gifted. It hurts their ability to transition into the mainstream, and that lack of transition to the mainstream keeps those vital new ideas from entering into the bigger world. And then you have... So essentially you have a widening gulf where you have a, an invested indie world which really doesn't want their artists to succeed beyond a certain... Compartmentalized region. niches. Thank you. And on the other hand, you have a growing corporate representation of music, which most people find alienating if you're a real, real music fan. Um, I can't listen to any of it. I mean, I mean, all the new stuff is just, it's, it's, it's bizarre. It is bizarre the way technology has affected what pop music has become. I'm not saying it's all bad, but it's hard when I came from a, uh, a world which valued certain systems of integrity to see that eroded basically to, to separate into two niche interests which really don't serve the overall whole. Billy, you were telling me last night that more and more you realized that the answer to just pure empty commercialism, to put words in your mouth, is is a spiritual understanding. And of course, you're not going to find that in a church or in some box. But I mean, for you, your, your spiritual walk, your spiritual awakening, uh, I tend to agree with you. I think that's really the answer to this artificial system is people tuning into the fact that we're in a limitless universe. Yeah, I, I find it inspiring sometimes when you talk about how when you're not really sure what to do, you go outside and look at the stars and you become you know, uh, integrated with the cosmos, you realize your place in it. Um, and I think that's what we all have to do. Um, we can't be so selfish as to not consider others. Um, we can't be so selfish as to not think that what we do in irresponsibility doesn't have an impact on somebody else. You know, there's that, you've seen the commercial or the thing in the movie where the guy knocks over the bottle and somehow it's 14 steps down and, you know, somebody gets hit by a bus or something. There is a continuity in quantum physics to what we do, the power of intention, the laws of attraction. And I think, um, you know, and, and it's by no means a criticism, but we, we discussed it in terms of your program. I think that, kind of like I alluded to before, uh, we all have to start thinking what success looks like. If we don't like the system that's in place, and hopefully we'll be able to engage your democracy to change it, um, that would be my uh, hope. Um, what does success look like? What does, what does a healthy democratic system look like in 2012? I mean, we're a far way from it, and I bet if you polled 100 people on the street, most people would say our democracy is, is 
is in need of an update. But it isn't like these jerk offs writing on there. The Constitution doesn't work anymore. You start to see those articles start popping up. Constitution's outdated. The Constitution's not outdated. No, we left it is the problem. Yes. So a return to constitutional values, uh, emphasis on liberty and freedom, uh, not being afraid of innovation and new ideas, rigorous debate. But what does that look like? Let's say, let's say we could wave a magic wand and we have the democracy that we can be proud of. What does that look like? In 2012, I think we need to start focusing on that because the power of intention is strong. You know, we have to see what, what happiness looks like, and we'll, we'll know where to go left and right as we walk down this particular... I agree with you. That's the biggest part I'm missing, is I'm just trying to get people to wake up and see the attack we're under. But you're right. You've got to have something to sell against that. Right. And I, and I, and I see interesting things. Uh, you know, uh, I see where people are doing co-op farming. People are forming collectives. People are getting together to pray. They're, they're forming their own churches. If they don't trust their own church, they say, well, let's just have our own church. It doesn't matter what denomination. Exactly. And they're creating their own media. And if you look at it, we were talking in the car today, they're attacking the individual farms and co-ops here in Austin. People buying their own cows, sharing them, their own farms. The feds and state are freaking out. Uh, all over the country, people are starting home churches, different denominations, different religions. They're shutting them down with zoning. The, uh, isn't there, isn't, didn't some community pass a law where you, you can't have more than two people together to... Yeah. Uh, California and areas of California, uh, Col but, but I mean, uh, uh, Colorado, but you're, you're, not right. you're not allowed to assemble in your own house now. It was some sort of weird law like that, right? Exactly. The reason I'm gibbering in, in excitement is you're absolutely right. The system shows us what's powerful by what they freak out by. That's and they're going after Amish. They're going after home churches. They're going after f backyard gardens. Hey, why do you think there's been a suppression of Native Americans all these years? The Native Americans is one of the is one of the richest, most incredibly beautiful con uh, cultures ever created on the face of the earth. Uh, whether you're talking about the Maoris or, you know, I, I mean, the, the Aboriginals in Australia. I mean, these people in many ways hold the key to our success, um, and those are those are values that that I really resonate to. And they're independent. They're not commercial. They're the enemy. So we need to, uh, as, a, as a culture, as a people who care about liberty, care about freedom, care about the future of our country, we need to start setting that intention. And we're never going to go, in, unless something horrible happens. I mean, you know, the iPad's a part of our life. The cell phone's a part of our life. This, so what does that mean? What is, how can we use technology in the right ways? How can you be an independent reporter? How can you create your own systems? How can people create their own systems to connect people together? How can you use the systems that are in place, the Facebooks and the Google Pluses? How can you use that to your advantage? If those systems are going to be there... You know what I mean? Instead of just plugging your fingers in your ear, well, how can you use that to your advantage? Um, of course, well, I agree. you're, you're, you're going to be spied on. But, <laughs> but a lot of people say, don't use any of the system. I say, do both. Build an alternative system and come out of the Babylon, but at the same time, go into the matrix and use its own system against it. You know, do both. Mm -hmm. I can, I, having been inside the music business, I can, <laughs> I can agree with you on that. Well, I have to say this. I have seen an exponential awakening because I don't claim to be the best at what I do. I mean, it's the imperfectness, though, that you know, basically fits into the larger whole. I have seen my own personal success reaching tens of millions of people. And there are so many others that are more articulate, who have greater gifts than I, and I'm seeing them come online. And I know that in that true diversity, that's what the corporate board can't stop. They can play whack-a-mole all day long, but they can't stop the signal. Yeah, and this is what I would say in, in conclusion. Even if you, Alex Jones, were wrong about everything you ever opined, even if you were wrong, the fact that you were willing to put those ideas to create that debate, that is the key. That's why people shouldn't be so scared of those ideas. And, and that is the key to our future, I think. It's not about whether or not you're right, I'm wrong. That, 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 is, that, is, that is a system that's put there in our psychology, by people who want to control our individual intuitive systems. Because at the end of the day, look, people can sit here and watch us talk for an hour. If they think we're wrong, great. <laughs> if it's coming from them, their own heart. If, that's coming, if, if people sit here and watch us and they say, these guys don't really know what they're talking about, and that's coming from inside them, that's God speaking through them. And maybe we are wrong. That's perfectly fine if it's coming from their own internal system of intuition. If they're buying a, a corporate narrative that convinces, a, uh, convinces them that we're wrong just because we're opening our mouths 
and we're questioning something, that should scare them because that means they're robots. That means they've been controlled by somebody along the way. They're actually not, they're not thinking their own thoughts, they're thinking somebody else. And that's Orwellian, and that should frighten them. What about this point? I find a lot of people say, you're probably right about this, but what are you gonna do about it? I choose to join the system. They think it's like joining the winning team or a bandwagon. When a team's going to the Super Bowl, well, then they buy the, the, the jersey or the T-shirt. It's almost like they think they can join with this inhuman, cold system because they've made a decision. I try to explain to them, you may delusionally think you're part of the system because you've joined it, but it's a system that destroys humanity. I mean, the only way to win is to resist this. And that's why I say resistance is victory. It doesn't mean we have all the answers, but we are saying we don't agree with this. And I think out of that debate will come the answers. Yeah, any system that's devoid of true leadership is troubling. And so when I see that in people where they just accept an idea without actually having their own internal debate, I mean, we've all been in those dinner conversations where you just kind of throw something out in the middle of the table and somebody goes, no. And you go, well, where did you get that from? Well, I was listening to, you know, Oprah or something, you know what I mean? They didn't actually have the thought. They heard somebody else express it and they go, oh, I agree with them. And they repeat it, but, but, but sometimes it's worse than that. They say, I hear what you're saying. I've talked to engineers. Mm -hmm. One time I was out camping, you know, at our family, you know, ranch, and, and I wasn't deer hunting, but we had some deer hunters there leasing the property. And then they were all engineers. And I said, well, they found two of the passports mm -hmm. in the rubble that day. That's impossible. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they said, I hear what you're saying, but as an article of faith, I can't believe that. And I was just like, well, that's crazy. But see, well, the way I look at stuff like that is if, if somebody needs to believe something for themselves, that's fine for themselves. That's okay. Because trying to convince somebody of something that they don't want to believe is sort of is a fruitless effort anyway. But at the same time, you have to be careful to preach to a choir. So really what we're... If, if, if myself as an artist and you as a as a pioneer in, in alternative alternative media, really what we're talking to people is on the edge who are willing to listen. The people aren't going to hear you anyway. It's sort of irrelevant. You know what I mean? They're just going to put their fingers in their ears, or they're going to create a debate within themselves that's going to negate you, no matter what you say, no matter how brilliant it is. And the people who already believe you. Well, in some ways, you're just preaching to the choir. It's the people who live on the edge who are really. They're, they're uncertain of their own personal narrative, and they're looking for information. Those are the people that ultimately you're reaching out. I totally agree. So many people go and speak to their family or whatever, and they get brushed off. They think, well, I'm done trying to wake people up politically, spiritually, you know, whatever the case is. And I'm like, no, there's always going to be the mass of people that just want to be followers, that don't want to hear anything complex, that just want to go cook their TV dinner and watch Dancing with the Stars. We're looking for the people that are in love with information and real reality and who get the fact that it's interesting, that's who is going to govern our future. And that's why the globalists try to dumb everything down and have people not have a debate because they're scared of people that do want to have a discussion. If I can offer a personal take on exactly what you're saying, I think we're a lot closer to a tipping point in the consciousness of humanity than it would seem to be. You know, there, there are people who have done studies of these types of things. You don't need 100% of the people to to go in a particular direction. You only need like 20% or so. Well, 10, yeah, the studies I've seen, 10, okay. you got it. Yeah. Okay, well, let's say it's 20, just for to make me look good. Let's say 20% of the, a given population needs to believe an idea for the other 80% to actually consider it as legitimate. Well, I think we're a lot closer to that number than you think. And again, it's not about the specifics of a particular idea. It's, it's, a, it's the idea to be open to the ideas. And I think we've seen a systemic dumbing down of the population over the last 20 years. Most of the people that I talk to, and I, and I talk to fairly successful and intelligent people, uh, uh, believe that the country's been dumbed down. Some believe it's been dumbed down on purpose. Some believe it's a resource issue. There's not enough money for the schools, stuff like that. It doesn't matter. But um, I do see a different type of awakening going on where, where people are engaging in, in topics and debates about things that were always off the table. It, I, it's not uncommon for me to be in a restaurant and hear people at the next table talking about the Federal Reserve because that idea has now been introduced into the mainstream culture via Ron Paul or somebody like that saying, why is this there? You know, why is this even in, in, in the chain of, of things? And even the idea, it's called the Federal Reserve, and then you come to find out, well, it's not even a branch of government. That was shocking to me when I found out that out about 10 years ago when I saw a documentary uh, by Aaron, I think it was Aaron Russo, right? Yeah. 
I happened to see him present the documentary, didn't even know what it was about, and was surprised. And so the point is, is as we're as we're on the edge of these ideas, we're closer to the tipping point of people wanting to hear a different narrative because the narrative that they've been fed is no longer working. You know what I mean? So yes, so you see a a turning up of the volume of the opiating aspects of society, a dumbing down of our culture to keep people more salaciously engaged. But for this whole other part of the population, they're in a much more rigorous debate than I've ever seen in my life, and I know that you see that. That's encouraging to me. So if we can get a big enough number in that particular realm, then that other 80% is going to be much more likely to listen because, in essence, they follow. They're not, they're not, you know, they're not people who are going to take the first step into a new opinion. Well, I agree with you. That's why the system is panicking and throwing out all the stops. And I found with those that are even partially awake, the acceleration of the tyranny is only waking them up faster. And we but, talk but, about... But, but you see it, it's, it's a calculation. It's like, it's like any general is going to calculate his risk versus his reward. Whoever's running those systems, whether they're benign, conscious, unconscious, you know, whether it was the Soviet eras or the Nazis or the Khmer Rouge, at some point they have to make a decision. If we don't come in and kill all these people or wipe all these people out or suppress this particular idea, it's going to get out of control. Well, you, you just scared me with that because Brzezinski, we have talked about this on air, two years ago said the people are waking up, the elite's in deep trouble. He made statements last month, and he's written about it similar in his new book that just came out, and he said 20, 30 years ago it was easier to direct socially through propaganda a million people than it was to kill them. Now it's easier to kill them than to have them believe us. And that's what's dangerous, is the elite are now discussing killing people to stay in control. They realize that they cannot, look, I believe we've already won. As you said, it's an exponential ripples in a pond. I can see it. Mm -hmm. The very fact that they're so greedy and want to destroy culture to control it and make people poor so we're controllable is going to make the empty bellies that cause people to wake up. So the elite have kind of engineered the direction they're going in, but they're not God, they're not all powerful. And now they're discussing really draconian things, and you see gun sales are at all time records. I, I, I don't see this working. But again, well, the way to counter darkness is with light, you know? And I, that's why I go back to the spiritual point. I think everything that you're, you're willing to address is worthy of thought. And, and, and the difference is, is whether we shroud that in shadow and anger and frustration and powerlessness or we put light on it and say, you know what, I want to know the truth. You know what I mean? Because to me, it's like, it's what core central idea you come from. If you say, I want to know God or I want to know love or I want to know the truth, that will direct your discernment. It will direct what you care about. Um, I'm, I'm, if that's true, which I'm sure it is, about the gun sales, that scares me because that's essentially people reacting on a fear. Now, you may say that's prudent, and that may be. But at the, in the higher octave, what needs to happen is people need to not be resonating with fear because they need to understand if they come from truth that the, the right things are going to happen eventually. Now, whether you're a sacrificial lamb or not, whether you're willing to put your ass out there in the middle and, and get your head cut off, <laughs> there's plenty of history to indicate that that can go either way. I agree. Let me just say this. I overall do not see it as positive that there's record gun sales, except that it's some form of action. It's not in a catatonic, narcoleptic coma. At least they're recognizing that there is a threat. I wish it was, I've said this on air, I wish you were at your city councils and at your state houses and knock it on yeah, the see that's, so that's buying gun buying a gun whether you would agree it's true or not that's more responding to an existential threat the real threat is is in your local communities where you're not taking care of the people in your local community if everybody just took care of the people in their local community it would eradicate a lot of this ability to control us. Exactly, but at least it's some steps showing that oh, there's a problem and I've said I wish you would use this as energy to go out and reach out to people instead of talking about how you're going to shoot UN troops, you know. Uh, yeah, I, I, I do believe uh, if if we were to if 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 we if we engage in if if you're willing to engage in the idea that there's a controlling force that wants something to happen and it's negative, right? I I'm on I'm on the side that believes that ultimately that ruling force wants the the, the least amount of trouble. <laughs> And the least amount of trouble is to keep people opiated, stupid, 
uninformed and believing a narrative which is really simple. Yes. Good guy. I have a wrestling company, right? What do we do? Good guy, bad guy. Okay? So I sit there and watch all day. You watch CNN, you watch Fox. Good guy, bad guy. Dumb, dumb, right? So my point is, is you know, as long as we're willing to try to understand that the narrative is being narrowed, if, if, if we're willing to be awake and listen to our own being in there, and whether they agree with you or not, that is, that is the revolutionary concept. That is the thing that leads to the victories that all of us want to have. A happy planet, a safe planet, a green planet, whatever. It's an info war. It's a fight in our minds, not physical. No, I don't, I, I don't and, and listen, it, again, if we're willing to believe that there's somebody standing there behind a curtain that wants bad things to happen, if they had their druthers, my guess is they don't want any trouble. It's far easier if everybody just gets in line and watches the same TV programs and just it all dumbs itself down and it ends up looking like Brave New World. Take this, be quiet, go to your job, da 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 so I'm, I'm hopeful that we don't have to get to any point that involves anything uh, horrific or violent. And um, I, that may sound a little Pollyannish, but that's, I, I have to believe in that. I, I can't believe in the other version because that, that takes me into a darkness that I don't believe in. I don't believe in that darkness. It doesn't mean I don't believe it's not there, but I don't believe in that darkness. That darkness is not going to not gonna get me or you anywhere. I know that when I talk to a lot of people in the power structure, they don't like what's happening, and they describe it as a kind of out-of-control beast. And it's all of our little actions that actually give power to the light or the dark. And, and, and I think in the final equation, it is about a resonance, about an energy. Um, closing comments on that. I think it's as simple as this. We've all stood in the line, you know, and... Uh, you know, or we're all trying to go through the same door. It's in that moment that you don't turn to your neighbor, smile after you. That's the, that's the root of how these systems control us. Because if you don't, you, you can't even see the human being next to you as a human being with a family, a history. If you're a judgment from the get-go is, they're the enemy, they must be negated, I, I got to exist in my little bubble. I was on a plane the other day, the guy was completely in his little bubble, his little technological bubble. He, I didn't exist. He didn't address me. He didn't say, excuse me. It was like I did not exist. And we, we all know what I'm talking about. We engage, we in, come in contact with, I've seen that 60 times here in the last couple of days. They revel in it. I don't know if those people are reveling it. I don't think they even know what they're doing. But the point is, is if you engage in that behavior, if you sort of go along with the dumbing down of society, you're part of the problem. You have to stand for your own value. If you're willing to walk through life in kindness, in, in humility, that's, that's, that's the seed by which everything grows. And that's what I mean about the micro and the macro. If everything you're saying is true, the way to fight it is with your own being, with your own sense of humility and self. Now, of course, somebody's going to write, you know, well, when they're coming over the wall, I, you know, the red coats are coming over the walls, I'm going to need my, my AK-47, okay? Well, they're not coming over the wall just yet. So I'm at this point where I, I believe in the energetic aspect of it. Well, obviously, there's a time to reap, a time to sow. I mean, we're trying to be like Obi-Wan Kenobi and loving and friendly, we, we've got to defend ourselves, we do. Uh, but I do think it's a cop-out to just say, I'm going to buy guns and get ready for war. The war is intellectual and spiritual talking to people. There is plenty of evidence to suggest in recent history that the, that the war of ideas can be won. You see where certain military actions don't happen if there's the right public outcry. You see if the right people protest, the right people stand up, certain things don't happen. They don't go down as easy. Look at SOPA. Look at the Internet censorship. I mean, on so many fronts. Because, but see, that, there's an idea where most people understood the narrative and they figured it out. And, and you saw where corporations had a backpedal. And then I saw other people in my business come out and say, well, stealing is bad. They reduced the argument down to stealing is bad. Well, why has this bill got all this other stuff in it that doesn't have anything to do with stealing is bad? Exactly. Um, what's the best? I mean, there's so many. We're going to be putting websites up here on screen. Um, what's the best website for, for a, a people to visit and, and see all the great work you're doing? Tell us briefly about your new album coming up. Uh, I have an album coming out probably in June, early June, called Oceania. Uh, we have uh, old Smashing Pumpkins albums being reissued, which is pretty cool with extra tracks and DVDs and stuff like that. I'm writing a book. Uh, Smashingpumpkins.com is probably the best, or my Twitter account. At Billy. Just at Billy. Do you have at, at, Al at Alex? Uh, it's. Uh, I guess you don't have the hookup like I do. I need that, yeah. Tell us more about the 
album, and then give us a little preview of what's going to be in the book. Uh, the book is a spiritual memoir, um, essentially my life from the perspective of, of a spiritual one as opposed to a celebrity one. We've all read the celebrity. I don't think we need to read that version of my life. Um, the album uh, is called Oceania. It's coming out in early June, and it's a sort of uh, people like kind of old school pumpkins mixed with some prog rock. Um, that seems to be the vibe in that. All right. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. It's been amazing. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is it for this edition of InfoWars Nightly News. We'll see you all back here tomorrow night and on the radio at InfoWars.com. A lot to think about. Ask yourselves, what are you doing in this time of great challenge? What are you doing to unlock minds? Go to InfoWars.com and PrisonPlanet.tv for the latest headlines and cutting-edge information.